Hello, everybody. What's three o'clock? You know what three o'clock means, right? I'm drinking my garlic. What does that mean? I'm going to do a little bio and put some stuff together. Uh, oh, well, we have time to do it all. Don't lay it up, Eddie. So, Dean Marcardi is the president of National Security Corporation. I just bring that up. And he's a business and a business thing. Sorry, we're doing it. Dean Marcardi is the president of National Security Corporation. That's a business that he founded over 30 years ago. He presents at dozens of training and speaking events each year. And he is the principal instructor for the SAMS Institute. He's here today because he's got a number of consulting gigs with blockchain the past, the past two years. And like you, which is he bought and held Bitcoin when it was a dollar? I didn't know what blockchain was, so I looked it up real quick for those that may not know. Blockchain, is, I define it as a public ledger of all cryptocurrency transactions. So, Mark's giving, Mark's giving us a presentation called Blockchain, the New Digital Swiss Army Knife. Blockchain is a technology that has been proposed as a solution to everything from frictionless currency transfer to tracking cargo on ships. With over $1 billion in venture funds invested and several hundred patents filed, every security professional must know the impact on the organization in terms of risk, volatility, and competitiveness. This talk will explore and provide a framework for utilizing and securing a technology considered as disruptive as the internet was in the 1990s. We'll have to give G. Mark two more minutes because I've taken so much of his time. Let's give an ISC square welcome for G. Mark Hardy. Presentation. Yeah, by the way, we're talking about that special character in the upper right hand corner. If you haven't heard it, go check and look for iPhone Crash. The uh, the new ping of death is back, but it uses a very obscure character that comes from the Indian alphabet that's something used by about 60 million people. So, anyway, we're here to talk about blockchain, the new digital Swiss Army knife. And, you know, a lot of us have heard about blockchain, right? Well, it's not everybody, but some of us have. And that's probably why you're here, mostly because you've heard of something called Bitcoin. Well, we've got a little bit of background on that, but it's not a Bitcoin talk. It's going to be about other things, but I kept getting people asking me for more and more information on Bitcoin. Anybody hold Bitcoin? Yeah, anybody got more than one? Uh, and it's going to be like, all right, that's, that's good. Okay, anybody well, got it when it was under 100 bucks? All right, he's buying! So, when you look at money, you find out that it's been around for a long time. Cattles, cowrie shells, bronze, copper coins, silver and gold, you know, uh, we've got the paper dose and gold standard, and now about the Bitcoin, oh, by the way, I can plug the PSI because they're letting me be here, and they, like Ira, they covered all my expenses to be here, on uh, all the transportation and things such as that. Um, so, thank you very much, uh, Dan Doyle, and back to you. But here's a question for you, how much money you got? I mean, no, really. You have to tell me, and it's none of my business, but how much money do you think you have? And can you show it to me? Because, you know, we have these little pieces of paper in our pocket that we carry around. Okay, that's fine, but where's the rest of your money? Well, it's in a bank account, right? Or it's in a stock account, or it's in your TSP, or something, or 401k, which lately is looking like a 201k. And we realize that, you know, it's just all a ledger in a computer. All the rest of it is money because you believe it's money and there's a shared trust that if we both consent to the same hallucination that there's money in the bank, then there's money in the bank. Now historically we use gold. Why? It's tangible, it's pretty, it's shiny, it looks great. And it's a limited supply. It's why what the alchemists have thought over the years and it's rather hard to go ahead and get more. All right, if you all of a sudden found like a trillion tons of gold that just land on some meteorite that's kind of land in your backyard, it would blow the economy away because gold would be everywhere. In fact, if you look back in around the 1850s in California, the president came out to visit, they didn't stack gold bars, they stacked silver bars because gold was so common, they thought silver was something special. And this thing that you have in your pocket, or if you're married, you might not have any more, but if you have these in your pocket, it's money because you believe it's money. Right? It's a Federal Reserve note. It's not backed by gold. It's not backed by silver. There's not enough gold or silver to back up all these currencies. If we got, what, trillion, trillion of these things in the hole, you know, what could possibly go wrong? Well, why do we even bother with money? The idea is it allows us to do a store and forward of value. I can dig a ditch for a man today and then buy a chicken from another person tomorrow, but I can go ahead and transfer that value forward. And money works a whole lot better than the old system when it's a cattle, where if I had cows and you had chickens and I want to buy a chicken, how do you make change with a cow? You know, I'll give you break off a leg, you know, you're getting them all at once. But it's potential energy. You can use it later for something. You can turn it to goods, you can turn it to labor, you can turn it to power. 
And so what we can do with money is, of course, we're familiar with layer seven of the OSI model. Of course, layer eight is what? Politics, right? But layer nine is money. Okay, with the money, you can control layers one through eight. Adam Smith in The Wealth of Nations in 1776 said the real price of everything is the toil and trouble of acquiring it. So what's valuable to one person may not be valuable to somebody else. And so we can look at something and say, why would you work so hard to get this? And other people can care less about it. That's all right. It's an individual choice. It's when two people agree on the value of something that you have a transaction. And if you don't agree on it, you just don't do the deal. So with uh, thanks to the a uh, fair use of the U.S. Code in uh, Title 17. I can borrow things from, let's say, Dilbert. But we find out that executives and managers really don't understand the concept of the blockchain. What is it? I mean, it's we get consults, we get projects, and things like that. But it turns out that nobody's really figured it out at the senior executive level with a handful of folks. And I think Forbes just announced last week their first list of cryptocurrency billionaires. All right, whole lot of money out there. So if I were to ask you, what's a two-word description of blockchain? The way it's been used, let's say, for example, with Bitcoin. What would you say? Distributed ledger. How about another two-word answer? Anyone? Bueller? Bueller? Come on! All right, so you're learning something. Okay, it is a distributed ledger, but I would submit it's more than a distributed ledger. It allows for what I call federated mistrust. Here's the idea. If you go ahead and you take a look at some of the original writings that had to do with blockchain and things like that, such as Bitcoin, the idea was it was allowing two people who don't trust each other, who don't trust the banks, who don't trust any, any intermediary to be able to still do a transaction because your trust is in the cryptography. It's in the math. Now, too much hype out there? I don't know. What people think blockchain can do these days is like that. If you can say the word blockchain, your stock price goes up. Didn't that happen with it? Long Island Ice Team, did they just change the Long Island Blockchain Company? And the stock went up. Not to be outdone, that giant of industry, whom we all remember as kids, but often forget today, Kodak, did what last month? They announced the Kodak coin, their new cryptocurrency. It doubled the stock price of the entire corporation. All right? This is nuts. Okay, we've got the hype of 1998 or 1999 relative to dot com. But the technology that we've got today is probably more along the lines about 1991. The hype is way, way ahead of what we could do. There's going to be winners, but there's going to be an awful lot of losers and a lot of things that crash and burn. So let's go back to the beginning. The original paper that was pseudonymously published by Satoshi Nakamoto back in late 2008 talked about a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. It did what? It was electronic cash without going through a financial institution. I mean, after all, the U.S. Treasury just printed up, I don't know, $700 billion worth of extra currency to give to the banks that were too big to fail. And the concern was what? The U.S. dollar was going to go the way of the Zimbabwean dollar, which ended up at, what, $50 trillion to one relative to the U.S. dollar. It's pretty bad. I mean, it wasn't even worth the paper was printed on. A peer-to-peer -peer network, it's a hash-based proof of work, which I'll explain in a minute. And the network itself requires minimal structure. This is interesting. So now what we have that is an entirely different business model. Instead of having a central bank that's going to issue a managed currency, instead of doing barter, where you and I work things out, hey, here's a cow, we've got a chicken, or gold is something as a reference, this is now going to be decentralized. So this original inventor, the Satoshi Nakamoto, who kind of faded from view, after publishing this paper and participating in the chat rooms for a couple of years, kind of got whisked away off to Valhalla or whatever. Who is Satoshi? Some people suggested a combination of a crypto mathematician, a businessman, people who don't believe in Bitcoin, call him a common man, or a C code. That's a lot of skills to have in one package. If you're really good and wrote all that software to get it rolling, or maybe just possibly, Satoshi Nakamoto was a team. They say nobody knows for sure, and there have been some pretenders to the throne. People have come out of nowhere saying, I am the inventor, but they've failed to be able to prove it cryptographically. And one of the news media actually found a dude in LA whose name was Satoshi Nakamoto. All right, he's like, we found him, we found the Zack inventor. And he was, his house had just been foreclosed on, he's living in an old Toyota. It's like, I don't know, this guy's supposed to have a billion dollars in the back, and he's living in an old Toyota. He's probably not the same guy. So we still continue to look for it, but the point was, does it really, really matter? 
So if you look at this original paper, has anybody actually read the paper? It's actually not too badly written. It's, it's written like an academic paper submitted with references and things, but best I can tell, it didn't want to peer review. Points out that internet commerce relies on financial institutions and trust with third parties. By the way, if you're using PayPal, they're not a bank, so they can hold your money as long as they like, and they don't have a problem with that. For anybody who's gone ahead and suddenly started selling a whole bunch of stuff, you'll find out that PayPal, eh, they'll keep the float on that for four to six months, deciding whether it's fraud or not. You substitute cryptographic proof for trust. Now I don't need to trust somebody anymore. I just need to trust the cryptography. And if the map is done correctly, it substitutes for trust. It's the federated mistrust that I was talking about. The idea of a transaction being computationally and practically to reverse. So what Jack was talking about earlier, some of the giants of things like Whit Diffie and Marty Hellman, who came up with the idea of doing the asymmetric cryptography, math problems that are easy to go one way, extraordinarily difficult to go backwards the other way. Works pretty well, except the problem is what? Like with any other democracy, as the Greek said, the problem with the democracy is 51% of the people can vote the other 49% into slavery. And the same problem is true with this technology. If you own 51% of the vote, you can forge, you can fake, you can double spend, you can do anything you want. And there's absolutely no precaution against it other than the mutually assured destruction promise of the 1960s that say if you go ahead and poison the blockchain with your false transactions, all that computing power that you have is going to go to waste because everyone's going to walk away. You're just going to saw off the branch that you're on. So it's kind of an interesting balance of trust or balance of that it works. And this did happen two years ago. One of the mining pools actually got above 51%. And everybody's freaking out. So what do you think they did? They split the two. They divided it. So they said, hey, this is not a problem. Because they didn't want to take this whole thing down. So basically, if you're looking at the concept of a blockchain, it's going to be, in this particular case, using with Bitcoin, a chain of electronic or digital signatures. You take a transaction. Sign it with your public key, okay, stand it with a digital signature, and then take a hash of this whole thing, and then take the hash of the one transaction and put it into the next block of transactions. So every 10 minutes you have to gather up all the transactions, calculate a hash on this, but before you do so, throw in the hash of the old transaction. If you're familiar with the mathematical hash, it's a one-way function with a fixed length output. Change one tiny bit of the input and half the output changes. There's no such thing as close to the hash. But the nice thing is, is because everybody's got a copy of the ledger, everybody can check it out. So if I have never met you before, I want to do a deal, you don't trust me, I don't trust you, but I got my copy of the blockchain, you got your copy, I can assert that I said, hey, I've got a Bitcoin, how do I know? Here's my public address wallet. Go take a look and go all the way back to 2009 and look at all the inputs and all the outputs. You say, yeah, you've got one more Bitcoin in than you have out, and you got it, so spend it. We sit around, have a cup of coffee, commit to the blockchain, we're good. And we do a transaction, and we never need to the bank. But we've got to agree on timestamps. And so each one's going to have a hash of the previous, which means we get this chain. It keeps on going. It's basically a giant adding machine tape with all these ledgers on here that every 10 minutes we cryptographically lock it down, sign it so nobody else can change it. And as a result, what you have then is a permanent record of every transaction that took place. Now, I mentioned proof of work before, and I'll give you a little bit of insight on it. How do you prove that you've done something? Because doing a hash is, well, trivial, right? It's just a simple algorithm. And so what happens when you talk about mining Bitcoin? Could you explain that to a six-year-old? If you know, I'd say, say that's the thing. If you've been Robert Feynman, the physicist, said, if you explain something to a six-year-old, you really need to explain it. Not to think that you're six years old or anything like that. However, think about it this way. Your teacher gives you homework. So in school, if you remember, the math teacher said, I want you to do problems 1 through 11, 13, A, B, and C, and 19. All right? And then turn in your homework the next day. What's that? That's proof of work. You only get credit if you can demonstrate you've done the work that you've been told to do. If you didn't do it, you don't get paid. Pretty simple. So all we're doing is substituting instead of doing your math problems, say, let's go ahead and calculate a hash. Well, if a hash is purely you know, fix the output, and by changing any input will completely change the output, it's kind of a numbers game. It's almost like a random number generator. If you had six dice, how many times would you have to roll the dice until you're going to get five aces? For those who played bar dice, you should know your odds. It's one in 7,776. 
Statistically, you'll find about halfway through. So you play bar dice about every 35, you know, about 30, you're probably going to get five aces, then you got to buy everybody around. At least that was the rule back in the day. So what happens then is everybody's trying to calculate this by perturbing and just adding a little bit of a nonce, a number used once, which changes the inputs ever so slightly until the first person gets it with the right number of beginning zeros, at which point you yell, bingo! Everybody else says, did you get it? It's trivial. It takes a fraction of a second to check the solution. If he gets it, we throw away all the rest of our work, we start on the next problem. Every 10 minutes, somebody yells, bingo, roughly speaking, because it adjusts for computational complexity. And then everybody keeps going. Now, what happens to two people? Pick a bingo! Well, you got to pick one to follow. So, 80% of the people pick yours, 20% of the people pick his. The next one comes out, this chain's longer. Because why? More people are following, more people work out. Eventually, you abandon the side chains. And so what happens is, because of the fact that it's taking all the computers in the world, all working simultaneously to solve the same problem, about 10 minutes to come up with an answer for a block, if you wanted to go back in time and change something, even, let's say, from an hour ago, you're six blocks behind. You're in the tail chase. To compute the hash, it's going to have the right number of zeros, because we all agree on that. You're going to have to then have all the computing horsepower of the world times six to be able to catch up. And the idea is that, that the whole world's working on it, then you're not going to be that much bigger. I don't even think if you're up at Fort Meade, you're going to be able to do it effectively. So the idea is you can't go back and recreate the past. What's in there, it's locked down forever. One of the guys that Jack talked about, Ralph Merkel, worked with him back in the early 90s with some stuff with the banking security. But the idea of being able to create a Merkle tree, meaning what? If I take two different items that are big, but hash them, the hashes are small, maybe only 256 bits. Well, if I have two different hashes, why don't I just hash the hashes together and still get 256? And hash and hash and hash and hash. All this thing becomes a tree, which means I can now say, I assert, based upon this hash, that these are my original 128 inputs or whatever. And you can recalculate the hash and validate that. Now I just need to store that hash out there. You can't come up with a counterfeit transaction because the odds of you finding a hash collision are 1 and 2 to the 128th power. Or if you're using ADS-256 or SHA-256 hash, 1 and 256 is a huge number. It's even bigger than the national debt, at least for now. Now, when you spend something on Bitcoin, they say you don't really have a Bitcoin. It's not a thing, even though you always see pictures like those little copper looking coins or whatever, which, by the way, are collector's items. But really, what you have is the equivalent of a bank account ledger. If you want to know how much money you have in the bank, you log into the bank and say you've got $822. But what if you couldn't log in anymore? But you were an old style person who kept paper records of everything. You could go back to the day you opened the bank account. Look at all the deposits, all the withdrawals, net them out, and know exactly what your bank balance is. And that's how you know how much is in a Bitcoin wallet. Because there's nobody keeping track, per se. You just go back and add them all up real quick. So when I spend something, what happens is money in, i got to spend the whole, wall, whole thing. If I've got 100 Bitcoin in my wallet, and I want to send you one, I've got to commit all 100 Bitcoin to give you one. And then the 99 comes back to me into usually another wallet. It's like, wait a minute, i got to put everything at risk? Yeah, think about it. If you went to the grocery store, you had a $100 bill, and you wanted to buy a cup of coffee for a dollar. Now that you could, but assume that you did. How much of that $100 bill do you have to get more for a cup of coffee? The whole $100 bill, you can't like tear a corner off of it. So it's the same idea, you can change back, no big deal. But by getting a new cryptographic address on the way back, nobody knows it's you anymore. In fact, nobody ever knew it was you because it's a, a base 58 hash of this big, long, address so nobody knows that you've got such a huge number of possible addresses, more than the number of atoms in the universe, at least that we estimate, it's pretty unlikely someone's going to come up with the same address. And oh, by the way, for those who love math problems, here you go. This is the idea of the gambler's ruin problem. Remember that tail chase I was talking about? So the gambler's ruin problem, and although the real problem that Bitcoin solved was the Byzantine general's problem, but we're not going to get too much detail because we are talking in general, so to speak. But if you went through the Vegas and you bet a dollar and you lost, if you want to walk out a winner, well, let's bet two. It's an even money bet, right? You win that, you get, you're up one. But if you're down, you're down three. So now you've got to bet four. If you win it, you're up one. But if you lose that, you're down seven. And then down 15 and down 31. You keep doubling your bets. Eventually, you've got to win. Except you might 
run out of money before you get to the point where you statistically get it. Yes, you can have 11 or 12 bad outcomes in a row, and that could bankrupt you. So the idea was we want to make sure that people don't cheat. So what do I do with blockchain? These transactions, we said, are recorded in a peer-to-peer -peer ledger. Using a gossip protocol, everybody can run the blockchain. You can go home and download this thing and run it home tonight. Download the big blockchain. It's going to take a while now. It's going to big. But you've got a whole copy of every transaction going all the way back to the beginning. And now, like in the early days, the only way you move Bitcoin is that I had the blockchain, you had the blockchain. Now we have companies in the middle. They'll go ahead and act as clearinghouse. So they get hacked. You get all your stuff stolen. But if you're hardcore, you probably have like a hardware wallet or something like that, which you keep your stuff to stored totally offline, unhackable. The cryptography helps it. The ledger is open. You can look anybody up. By the way, you can add common fields to it when the problem is your stuff that's stuck into there. One of the issues people have about blockchain is you make a mistake, it's permanent, okay? You can't get out of it because you can't un undo anything. It's, you can't delete stuff. Everybody has their own copy, and then you all agree on it. Now, I don't need trusted relationships anymore. Much in the way that with the Diffie Hellman key exchange, I could exchange a key directly under the nose of my opponents without them being able to sniff it because of the way we do the math, which is why, by the way, internet commerce works. Imagine if you had to go to eBay or Somebody wanted to buy something, he said, okay, great, type in your mailing address, and we'll mail you a sealed envelope in three days, you can open it up, type in your key, and you're good to go. That would really slow things down, wouldn't it? So by being able to do this cryptographic stuff, we can move it back and forth. I don't have to have all these intermediaries. I don't even have to bank vouch for me. I don't have to produce three forms of identification. I don't have to go ahead and get a notarized statement. I just go. And now I can settle within a few minutes. And this could be catastrophic for companies that make a ton of money in transaction fees. So a few years ago, I was in the country of Qatar. Some people call it Qatar, but they call it Qatar over there, so I'll use their words. And quarter million people, about 1.6 million expatriates, doing everything from driving taxis to cooking the meals to doing every labor type thing that had to be done. These people don't get paid very well, even though it's an incredibly wealthy country, because they don't have to pay well. They all come to the Indian Ocean region, things such as that. And on payday, they all line up in front of the Western Union, and between a bad exchange rate and high transaction fees, it costs them about 9% of their paycheck to send their money back home to their families. It's expensive to be poor. Imagine if in 10 minutes, for the cost of about a penny or two cents, you could move your money completely across the world. It would disintermediate all these financial institutions that take out a whole lot of money. So we're not surprised when Jamie Dimon says, Bitcoin is horrible, it's terrible, it's a disaster. Because it could be horrible and disaster for you, sir. And oh, by the way, who took that $700 billion back then? It wasn't Bitcoin, it was you bankers. <clears throat> Never mind. So what does blockchain really look like? It's really just a big, long text string. You've got a couple fields in there. You've got the hack, the information in, the out, the size. You can even create a lock on it so you can go ahead and, and save it for later. This, again, confuses things a little bit because I'm using Bitcoin as an example of blockchain, but not all cars are Fords, but Fords could be cars. Hopefully you understand the difference. So, so this is the transaction. It just stores a whole bunch of text. I hope I there's room to go ahead and put a text field in there. <coughs> And so there's a lot of stuff that's kind of hidden in there. There's all these Easter eggs you can look in for there. So what happens with this mining? As I said, the mining, the idea is to produce a hash that begins with a certain number of well, zeros. Okay, if it's binary, the odds of getting something that begins with a zero are one and two. If it begins with zero, zero, and binary is one and four. Zero, 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 one and eight. And 16 and 32. So the original blockchain that was young for, done for Bitcoin in January 2009 required two to the 32nd power. But that's half the time you get it. So about halfway through, it turned out that that's 4.2 billion. It's about the size of an IPv4 address space. But the nonce, the number used once, they go try one, try two, try three, try four, until you get the combination that works turned out to be about 60% of the way through, which statistically makes about sense. On average, you'll do it about 50%. Sometimes you'll be very lucky to get it quickly. Sometimes it'll take it forever. And these blocks could take 20, 30, 40, 50 minutes just because bad luck. But it's all probabilistic. So that's fine and good. And someone says, what are you doing? I'm mining Bitcoin. How do I do mining Bitcoin? Just calculate a hash with the right number of zeros, and you get 50 new Bitcoin. That's your reward for doing the proof of work. All right, let me do it. As more people do it, it gets harder and harder. 
The difficulty factor goes up. So the more people that play, the harder it is to come up with the answer. How hard is it today? So yesterday, we're up over half a million blocks, required 75 bits, all zero. By the way, that's 2 to the 75th power. That is a humongous number, and oh, by the way, the 50 Bitcoin reward was cut in half, and then cut in half again about every four years, till eventually the year 2140, there's no new Bitcoin. But there's a lot that's been lost over time, too. So the early people said, eh, I had my hard drive, I threw it away. And now you're like, I could have had millions. Or with the transaction fees, which got really stupid, ridiculous last fall, up to 50 bucks a pop, well, they had $8 in your Bitcoin wallet that cost you $50 to get it out, you just threw it away. So there's a lot of dust that's being generated. It's like brake shoes. Bitcoin is wearing itself out. It's not the only cryptocurrency that's out there. But there's a lot of them, but this is kind of the grand age. And oh, by the way, you did some extra stuff because now we're replacing that with fees. So what have we come up with? It turns out that, in my opinion, Bitcoin is mankind's least efficient invention ever created. 99.89% of your solutions are wrong. You throw them away. The amount of energy being consumed to mine Bitcoin is now approximately that of the entire nation of Singapore. And if you take a look at the carbon footprint, everybody seems to be worried about that. What about 24 million tons of carbon dioxide? I submit that historians of the 22nd century will record that the true cause of global warming was Bitcoin mining in the early 21st century. <laughs> and we're finding out in a place like Iceland where there's more power being consumed to mine Bitcoin than there are to power households because they all the geothermal stuff like that. So something's not sustainable here. We're kind of going off the deep end. But man, what a ride! We went from 800 bucks or so in March when a friend of mine who's way into Bitcoin said, G. Mark, sell your house, put everything you own to Bitcoin. Well, I didn't. And of course, went from eight hundred dollars to nineteen thousand. My buddy's like, "Come on, just now. Come on, just now. We should have done it." But I'm sorry, you know, if you're this person was twenty-four years old. If you're twenty-four years old and broke, you're okay. You're like about anybody else who graduated from college with student debt. You're probably better off than that because they got a hole here and all. But when you're a little bit older, you really don't want to be broke because I'm still not sure I want to eat cat food out of the dumpster behind Walmart, okay? It's just not the future I intended. Although I am in Florida, I guess I'd get a trailer, you know, bicycle, and maybe I'll end up that way. But I didn't want to do that. And it turns out it was probably pretty good. Oopsies, because we went from 19000 sorry, I can't see the graph, $19,891 U.S. down to 6000 bucks beginning of this month. Oh boy. But then, two days later, yeehaw, happy, happy, joy, joy. You look at all these different cryptocurrencies out there, and they're all seriously in the black. Some of the 30% in a calendar day. I mean, can you imagine your retirement account doing this? All it takes is a little bit, you're done. The problem is nobody knows when to let go. So my friend who went all in at the bottom, went from at the top, was at five million US dollars last year. Said, sell a million. No, oh, no, it's gonna be worth more. Said, trust me, sell a million. I didn't listen to you. I didn't go all into Bitcoin. Okay, may a couple, may a couple, may a max a couple. I screwed up. But now it's your chance to not screw up. Held everything and rode the five million down about one point three. But it's not going back up again. So who knows? Said either it'll be your neighbor or I'll be cleaning your pool, one or the other. <laughs> so I started talking about Bitcoin four years ago. But I said I don't date the patient because they didn't want, want to get tied up with all the hype and everything else about Bitcoin and blockchain and things like that. Which is interesting because the um, patient turned out to be kind of hot and probably should have gotten something going. But I tried to stay <laughs> out of that to be objective. Well, baby, come on. That's not a good idea. As they say, that's why, um, I mean, if knowledge were the key to success, the Forbes 400 would be populated with librarians. And if intelligence were that, it would be populated by professors, okay, obviously it's something else at work. But there's a lot of different things we can do, but I did some more research and found out more uses for blockchain. Turns out a lot of other people have too. The blockchain patent applications are going nuts, okay, and so it turns out that companies are bragging about this huge, huge amount of R&D that's going in there. I think it was interesting that there are almost 60 patents filed in 2010 in the U.S. By now, they've either been approved or disapproved. Patent and trademark office tends to be a little bit slow, but not that slow. AT&T got a patent for Bitcoin-powered subscriber server. 
So, and it's in patent language, by the way. I've ever written a patent, I've done some patent work, I've done some uh, expert witness work and things such as that. Uh, distributed secure home subscriber server system utilizing Bitcoin blockchain, which is interesting, they call out Bitcoin specifically, but I'm sure there is another number. Oh, yeah, and they're doing it with another blockchain because it turns out the claim in things that patents will have all these different claims. Do it with this, do it with this, do this. You think you invented anything, now you're just kind of throwing spaghetti at the wall. If the patent trademark office approves it, and six years later somebody else actually does figure it out, then you go ahead and you sue. I tell people, you know, you have a patent, great. Patents don't make you rich. It allows you to make a lawyer rich. All right? Think about it. Okay, big company's going to step all over there. I'll spend it. And you get the intellectual property holding companies, <laughs> patent trolls, if you will, uh, who have now got really excited when Bitcoin broke 19000 bucks in December. And they said, you know, we're going to go ahead and see what we can do to make some money off of this, too. Bank of America, track and validate user identity, changes the user identity and a generic patent to convert unsecured instruments through a validation process. Now, an instrument being a financial instrument like that. So, not musical. So we're going, banks are in on it. Bank of America got stuff, AT&T got stuff. You know, who's kind of generally missing here? J.P. Morgan Chase. They didn't really get on the bandwagon early on. They were to blockchain patent filings like Germany was the colonization of, the, of European. You know, they didn't do much. You know, finally Germany said, you know, we need to get a colony. Everybody else got a colony. We only went there. So what did they finally get? For those who are historians, every, well, they in India. I mean, British got India, but they, they got parts of China. Did you ever get Qingdao beer? Or Tsingtao, if you can't pronounce it. But the Qingdao beer, which comes from Shanghai, is on the, along the Bund, the B-U-N-D. Where do you think the Bund comes from? It's a German word. Because the Germans got there, they taught them how to brew beer over there. But you find out that, you know, yeah, so what, that much. Now we're looking at some of these banks saying, we want to be this big. I think what happened is J.P. Morgan Chase got some of their patents approved because about a, three weeks ago, J.P. Diamond's now said, you know, I'm sorry about all the bad things I said about it before. We suggest that the change of heart was not due to the fact that, uh, he changed his heart. Bank of America, 10 new currency publishers. By the way, I got a whole set of uh, references you want to look these things up. AT&T, a cryptocurrency car payment in new patent filing. You can now pay for your new automobile with cryptocurrency. It's stored in a memory conjunction with a purchase of goods or services and it's credited purchase price, which suggests that if you, you, know, you drive your car a certain way, you can prove on resale that it hasn't really been beaten up too badly at the used car market. Like the story, my dad told me the car, you get a real low mileage car, only 500 miles, quarter mile at a time. All right, we're not much left of that engine. Accenture, this, come on, an editable blockchain, the whole idea of a blockchain is not editable. So I talked to somebody, the people, they said, we missed out on it. So we filed something that nobody else is going to file because, well, it's kind of a stupid idea. This is like permanent marker that you can erase. Why would you have a permanent marker you can erase? Why not just use non-permanent markers? Well, because everybody's into permanent markers. Everybody's into blockchain. So they say, hey, you know what? The, uh, we get rid of stuff because eventually the Bitcoin blockchain is going to be so big, it's going to fill a planet. By the way, the Dow hack, actually, that's a year and a half ago now. Uh, pornography, there's 25,000 WikiLeaks memos that are into Bitcoin. Uh, Dan Kaminsky had a little bit of fun where he went ahead and he took a ASCII image of his friend Len Sassman who had died and stuck it up on the blockchain and then just for fun decided to go ahead and uh, put the Fed chairman in there as well, figuring that uh, Bert Bernanke would be a nice addition to the blockchain. And I really like what Dan said about Bitcoin several well, years ago. He said, most cryptographic things you see look good on the surface, and then you realize they're all junk underneath. He said, this looked like junk on the outside, but the cryptography was really, really well done. So let me walk through a quick tour of the force of the different types of industries that I've seen do this. And I, I've worked on several blockchain projects now, which is kind of interesting, because it hasn't been around that long. There's nobody with 10 years experience on your resume, so sorry, monster.com, you can't check that box. But the whole idea is, in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. And if you've been doing some work, or if you're looking for something from a career perspective, consider learning more about blockchain. University of Nicosia has a free course. It literally just started this past week, a massive online course that they have, where they're first class and a master's in cryptocurrency. But the first one, they give it to you at no charge. Learn something about, not just Bitcoin, but about the idea of blockchain and the technology you can use, because I think this is our new dot com. 
And security is going to be huge. As security professionals, it took us a long time for people to recognize the value that we bring to the business by protecting core critical processes. But now blockchain is coming out of the shoe with a lot of issues that could potentially be disrupted. And so now with your security background from your careers, you add some unique value. And I think you might find that if you spend a little bit of time and actually study this stuff, you can improve your career marketability very effectively in the next couple of years. Banking, <laughs> although the whole idea is I think the fact that you got a two-letter domain is probably the best claim you've got to think. By the way, I had a one-letter domain back in the 90s, and I kind of let it go just because it was a proof of concept. Ah, it'll always be there, right? <laughs> Coinbase, by the way, is a good place. It's legal. You can actually buy and sell Bitcoin here in the United States. A lot more know your customer requirements, KYC and AML, anti-money laundering that these places are doing. So if you want to get involved in something like that, you go to Coinbase. In fact, they'll even give you a QR code at the end. They'll give you $10 if you sign up. Full disclosure, I get 10 bucks of Bitcoin too. But if you don't use it, you get nothing. So it's better than nothing. All right, maybe I'll buy you a beer. But the idea was is that several of these companies that allow you to do payments and, and money transfers. Cybersecurity, I'm not quite sure why climbing upside down on a rock helps you portray this. It's one of these sort of esoteric things. You just have to get into the zen of it. But guard time KSI system is a blockchain technology that gives you massive scale data authentication. Woo. How about education and academia? Now this is happening a lot. The University of Nicosia said they are the first company that went ahead with graduation certificates. They moved all their academic records into the blockchain. Because we hear about things like an Equifax where the lady who is in charge of security at Equifax, they finally pulled her tickets and they found out that her undergraduate degree was in what? Music. Music. Everybody went, oh, yeah, you're kidding me. Actually, as a cryptographer, I'm pretty impressed. The same skills that part of your brain that make you good at music make you good at cryptography. But the press doesn't see that. But the point was, is that you get a lot of people who are faking their credentials and things like that, not fakeable. Now this is not just an open blockchain, this is what we call a permissioned blockchain, where only proper individuals can add records, not just you and me like Bitcoin, that's an open type of blockchain. But now if only registrars of universities that are accredited could write to this thing, think about it. Now you can go ahead and verify that. Voting! Ah, oh, yeah, let's keep the Russians out, we'll put everything in the blockchain. Once it's in, it's in. Yeah, we'll see how that goes. By the way, although everybody's saying, oh, these Russians continue to interfere with us. It's like, wait a minute, the election was 15 months ago. We're doing our own interfering with it right now. I mean, you know, who, who's consuming whose own tail right now? I can't imagine Vladimir Putin sitting back. <laughs> Look at him. I'm still going. Yeah, oh well. That's why I don't like politics. Carly Singh, you can do lease and sign insurance contracts. With DocuSign. Well, okay, fine. If the cars last as long as the ledger entries, I'll buy. <laughs> but chances are that's not going to help your liability one bit. This one is interesting. Go ahead and power your drone on the blockchain. A uh, long-range wireless network anywhere but using a blockchain. Again, this is one of those things like, really? How does this work? But they're getting money. Forecasting. This one, it's a financial company. Auto combines the magic of prediction markets with the power of a decentralized network to create a stunningly accurate forecasting tool and the chance for real money trading profits. Which makes you ask, if it were really that good, why would they give it away? Why don't they just do it themselves? All right? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, we, we figured out the secret to make money, so we're going to sell it to you. It's like the psychic news. You know, whether it's the psychic network, they went out of business, how could they not see that coming? <laughs> Music and entertainment, okay, I've worked on a blockchain project for one of the Hollywood studios, who's looking at going ahead and creating a type of cryptocurrency that can be used to help bring certain music, or not music, but movies to market. Because right now there's only about 15, 18 people that decide what actually goes to production. And Hollywood sometimes gets a hit, but they sometimes get a bust. And so as a result, by going ahead and letting people buy these cryptocurrency coins, go ahead and put them on blockchain, have them be worth something, instead of proof of work or proof of stake, everybody andies up, the ones that people like, they'll go ahead and move forward. The problem with a lot of these things though is what? If you could substitute the word database for blockchain, it still get the same result, then I respectfully submit that you don't have a winning idea. Although you get some money. Your overall alternative has arrived, why the blockchain? Okay. Stock trading, a distributed ledger for capital markets. Now this has a little bit of value because you go ahead and you take a look at things such as that, such as um, 
what happened when you had, I don't know, some problems up in New Jersey several years ago when we take a look at somebody creating logic bombs, Roger Duronio going ahead and blowing up Payne Weber by destroying all the customer records. There's no longer a Payne Weber anymore. Okay, and so what happened? They couldn't recreate stuff, but if it's all went into a permanent ledger that was stored multiple places around the world, works great. Right. Real estate. This, I don't know about what their idea is, but here's my idea. Does anybody ever bought a house or thinking of buying a house? Yeah, sure. What do you have to do? You have to go ahead and do what? You have to go ahead and get a title search, and then you have to get title insurance. Well, title insurance. You just did the search. What am I insuring against? If you didn't do your job? Yeah. Well, why do I have to pay you hundreds and hundreds of dollars to title? I already paid you to do your job. Okay. We don't sell insurance. By the way, 80% of the title insurance is a commission that goes to the real estate agent. <laughs> so, what you find out is this. What if you put all these property records up on the blockchain? And so, if you have a Bitcoin address, you have a street address. You want to know if the property is free and clear? You just go ahead and search the public records. You do it at home. Everybody can do that from home now. It's permission blockchain, right? Only great people can write to it. I add up all the leads. I add up all the lien satisfactions. If the number is zero, it works. Now I can then go ahead and get rid of my title search. And oh, by the way, don't need title insurance because the blockchain is unalterable. We just blew away two different industries. We make Uber look like Boy Scouts because there's still taxis going. These folks are gone. They're going to have to do a real job. They're going to have to go do something useful and add some value instead of being a parasitic type of an industry. Sorry, but it's a parasite. <laughs> and so now what happens is you do a smart contract where you go ahead and you put a computerized program, you write it saying, I insert into the contract my deed, you insert into the contract the money that you're going to buy, put it in Ethereum or whatever. And the condition says is this, if at the time of execution, the sum of liens minus the sum of lien satisfactions equals zero, the contract is valid, otherwise not. Now if somebody tries to like slide something at the last second, it busts out and the deal doesn't go through to clean it up. Once it's cleaned up, then the deal goes through. And it's impossible to rewrite the past, so therefore you had a clean thing. And guess what? Sorry, that real estate commission is 6%. This went down about 3 cents. Insurance. Trust the process. Okay. That's right. Healthcare. You know, your health is protected on the blockchain. You're like, no one's going to steal information off the blockchain. Like, they can go ahead from Anthem or something like that. Again, the enterprise blockchain company, I look at some of these things, and maybe they're onto something, you just haven't read the prospectus long enough, but um, I remember an old Dilbert cartoon where dogs were just saying, you know, uh, prospectus, it's a Latin word meaning open your mouth and close your eyes. All right? <laughs> Supply chain management. This makes a lot of sense to me as well, being able to prove where your stuff came from, and the fact that nothing's been changed, and it's been locked in. It's also being, if you move a truck across a border, you know what's in it, it doesn't change. Store yourself in the cloud, <laughs> but you can't get it out. You can't get it out, but you can never get it off the cloud. Okay, I'm not sure that's going to work. Energy management. <laughs> Wait a minute, peer-to-peer -peer energy transaction? This whole idea is what? When you got all this extra power generated that you're not using, instead of just sending it to ground, what you got to do is send it to find Bitcoin. You know, there's little power plants all over the world that have extra Bitcoins or whatever it is, and they swap around because it's quote-unquote proof of energy. Sports management. I'm not sure how this works. You go ahead and ride around on the Bitcoin. But... <laughs> it's fast and looks cool. Get going. Gift cards and loyalty programs. If there's not enough fraud in this program already. But you can put them on the blockchain. By the way, about $16 billion in credit card fraud. I did a lot of work in fraud prevention. And what I found out is one of the favorite ways to launder money is to go ahead and do what? Buy a gift card and break the chain. Because it's an entirely different ecosystem of information. Bridge those two together. Wow. Can you guess something? Government and public records. I am certain that every one of our elected officials wants complete transparency on everything that takes place of where the money goes and how it was spent. Yeah, like any government's ever going to work for this. This is Pollyannish, but it's a great idea if you can get the government to be transparent. Gun tracking, okay, a lot of people worry about it, but it doesn't do anything one way or the other than to create a permanent ledger. And by the way, if you live here in the great state of Florida, you take a look at the the rules and the laws is written into the Florida Code that no government agency shall create a database that tracks ownership of firearms. That's the right we have as a resident of the state of Florida, so this probably wouldn't work. Wills and inheritances, sure, I can see this. Where is the will? <laughs> what was my inheritance? Look it up, okay? Now you know you got to still be nice to grandma for a little while longer, because otherwise she's going to change the blockchain. Retail, buy and sell freely using cryptocurrency. Okay, you don't really need the thing, but the whole idea is earn Bitcoin by doing referrals. Okay, that'd be kind of fun. How about charities? This I like. If it cuts out the middleman, because you look at some of these charities that are burning 20, 30, 40, 50 percent 
of the money that's going to it goes to overhead. What if you could drive that down to a fraction of a percent and the money actually went to the people who needed it? Law enforcement, global standard for blockchain intelligence, is hunting down criminals on blockchain by being able to track down where the bad guys have put their money and try to unravel stuff. I've helped venture capital firms figure this stuff out and they said, okay, we're going to buy it and bet these guys. I asked one question, how do they deal with the Bitcoin mixer? And they <laughs> back, well, we'll get back to you on that. Human resources with blockchains, business and corporate governance, credit histories. Yeah, like this is going to really solve problems. Let's make your mistakes permanent. By the way, I got to wonder if you heard that GDPR talk earlier today, how in the world is the right to be forgotten going to be at all compatible with the blockchain which can never be a delete? They're totally incompatible goals. 3D printing, going ahead and protecting folks, crowdfunding, almost done here, and a ton of references so I can land this thing right on the numbers. But the point that I'm trying to get across is what? Blockchain is kind of the new digital Swiss Army knife. It's got a lot of promise, a lot of hype, a lot of false promises. A lot of things are going to crash, but they're going to be survivors. They're going to be winners. There's going to be some really, really big winners. So I do not recommend mortgaging your house and buying Bitcoin. If you want to, think of it as like a lottery ticket. Buy some, set it aside, and do it. But learn about the technology. Use it to change your career trajectory. You might find yourself in several years, and I'll be very happy that you learned it. So thank you very much for your time. Appreciate it.